leading us through this part of our service. Once again, I want to welcome everyone back. It's so good to see you back this week. I know last week a lot of y'all played it safe, and, and we're so glad you did. We want you to be safe and come back to us, and uh, pray that we won't get any more of that ice or snow. Well, maybe the kids want to be off school or something like that. But uh, that everybody can be safe on a Sunday and on a Wednesday. We're so glad to have you back here. Uh, we're in this series called Back to the Beginning. And what we're doing at the beginning of the year is we're going back to the beginning of our faith, the foundation of it through the book of Genesis. And today, we've got a big one. Today, we are shifting gears and moving over to Abraham. Now, Abraham is one of those that, from Genesis 12 on, it pretty much talks about Abraham. So I'm going to take, and so there's 50 chapters in Genesis, so I'm going to take the next uh, three hours and go through, no, just kidding. <laughs> I'll all do that. There's some to I will have to, no, I do have some homework for you. Okay? So we're going to be looking at today in Romans chapter 4, but for homework, what I want you to do this week is read Genesis chapters 15 through 18 and 21. That's five chapters. That'll cover what we're talking about here today, um, about the promise that God gave to Abraham and how it's fulfilled in the birth of Isaac. And it'll prepare us for next week, because next week we're going to talk about the, the test of Abraham's faith. We're going to talk about when God called him to sacrifice his son and what that means for us. So that's your homework uh, for this week, is to read Genesis chapters 15 through 18 and 21. And today, though, we will be looking at Romans chapter 4. Well, let's pray before we get too far into it. Would you bow with me? Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for today, and we're thankful that your word teaches us so much. And that by going back to the beginning, by looking at the book of Genesis and looking at those pillars of our faith, we can be inspired today, 2,000 years, actually more than that, later. So God, we pray that you would be with us today. God, we pray that you would open our minds and our hearts, that you would speak and we would listen, and you would teach us and guide us in what we should do. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. How important is the founder of a company or an organization? How important is that founding person? What about for a country? How important are the founding fathers? We talk about that a lot. What were the intentions of the founding fathers, what were their wishes. There's one company that it just fascinates me to read the story. It, it's the Apple Computer Company. If you're like me, you probably have a product that is made from the Apple Computer Company. I have several. But their story is a really interesting one. You see, the Apple Computer Company started in 1976 by two Steves, Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak. They started it in the garage. And uh, by 1985, it had grown to be this, this multi-million dollar company. But in 1985, Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak, the two founders, were ousted from the company. There was a difference in opinion on where the direction of this company should go. And they both, Steve Wozniak resigned first, and Steve Jobs was kind of forced out. Uh, and he resigned and went on to do other things. And the Apple Computer Company continued on, but over the next uh, 12 years, they began to lose revenue. They began to lose competition. They, they went downhill as they began to lose to Microsoft, primarily. That was their main competition. So in 1987, while Apple was a struggling company, they decided to hire back Steve Jobs and made him the CEO of the company again. And Steve Jobs, one of the founders, addressed the company by saying these words. If we want to move forward and see Apple healthy and prospering again, we have to let go of a few things here. We have to let go of this notion that Apple has to, for Apple to win, Microsoft has to lose. We have to embrace this notion that for Apple to win, Apple has to do a really good job. If others are going to help us do that, then that's great because we need all the help we can get. And if we don't do a good job, it's no one else's fault but our own. So I think that's a very important perspective. The era of this of setting this up as a competition between Apple and Microsoft is over as far as I'm concerned. This is about getting Apple healthy and about Apple being able to make incredibly great contributions to the industry and get healthy and prosper again. And 
you know, as you know, maybe you don't, but from that time on, Apple went from a struggling, failing company to being worth, as of August of last year, over a trillion dollars. <coughs> one of the most successful companies in the world. And I think, how important was that vision? And I think there's some truth in there that we could, we could take from today, that you know, if something's going to succeed, we can't blame outside forces for failure. We have to take responsibility. I think that's a good lesson, but I think the important lesson for us here this morning is the vision of the founder and the faith of the founder inspired the company to move to great heights. And so I say, how important is a founder? Because as we talk about Abraham this morning, we are really talking about the founder. The founder of not only our faith, but of the three major faiths in the world. Abraham is a foundation for us. He's the foundation of our faith. Just Here's a few numbers for you. The number of chapters that are dedicated in the book of Genesis just to Abraham's life, just to him being alive, 15. It begins at the end of chapter 11. So all of creation and the flood and sin and all of that, it gets 11 chapters. And then Abraham's life gets the next 15. And then the rest of the book of Genesis follows his family. Isaac, Jacob, Joseph follows the rest of his family. So the book of Genesis really shifts gears in chapter 12. His name is mentioned in the entire Bible 311 times. In the New Testament alone, it's mentioned 74 times. And Jesus talks about Abraham on seven different occasions. In the Hebrews chapter 11, we have what we call the Hebrews Hall of Faith. And what this is, it's a list of all these people that went before us that were foundational to our faith. And most of the people at list just get a verse or just get a, a mention. In fact, Moses, you know, <coughs> Moses, he gets five verses in the chapter, the chapter 11 of Hebrews. Abraham gets 12. Half of the chapter about faith is dedicated to Abraham. I mentioned the world's religions. Over 55% of the world's religions, of world religions followers claim him as their father. You have Christianity, which is the largest. You have Islam, which is second. And Judaism all claim Abraham is their father. If you grew up in church, maybe you sang that song, Father Abraham, and then he sons. Oh, you just thought it was a fun song, you know? You get to do your arms and kick your legs and all that. You thought it was a fun song, but actually, it's true. He does have many sons. In fact, more than 4 billion people in the world today claim Abraham. Is a spiritual father. For over 4 billion. There are 7.4 billion estimated in the world today. So that's 55% of the entire world claims Abraham as their father. Aside from Jesus Christ, no one person has influenced the world more than Abraham. So Abraham is a very important person for us to know about. But what is it about him that made him so influential? What is it about Abraham that inspires these billions of people? What did he do that made him special? Well, Genesis chapter 15, verse 6 tells us, and also it repeats it in Romans chapter 4, verse 3. So we'll study Romans 4 today. But it simply says this. Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. So really, it's not actually what he did. It was about the faith that Abraham had. He believed God, and because he believed God, it was counted to him as righteousness. God made a promise to him that he would have a son, and that his son would turn into a great nation, and that the entire world would be blessed. And Abraham believed God. He is the founder of our faith. And he reminds us that faith is the foundation for everything we do. Let's look at Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4, we're going to pick up in verse 3 and read verses 3 through 8. Romans chapter 4, verses 3 through 8. For what does scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. 
Now the one who works, are his wages counted to him as righteousness? No, the one who, now the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but they are counted as what is due to him. And to the one who does not work, but trusts in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted to him as righteousness. Just as David, who also speaks of the blessing of the one to whom God counts righteous apart from their works. David says this, Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven, and those whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count his sin. Abraham reminds us that the foundation for our forgiveness, the reason that God doesn't count our sin against us, the reason why we're blessed, isn't what we've done. It's about faith. And faith has to come first. Faith has to come before good works. Faith has to come even before repentance. It has to come before circumcision, which is what Paul's arguing against here. Faith has to come before baptism. If you come up here and get dunked in the water and you just wanted a bath, that's all you got. You got to have faith as the foundation for a right relationship with God, for righteousness. He uses the example of if you've worked to earn it. So we're near the end of January. Maybe some of you all have started to get your W-2s. You've got your statements from the bank or things like that. That usually starts coming out around the end of January. Well, when you get your W-2 and you're looking at the line about your, your wages, are you like, oh, well, that was a nice gift. When you read that or when you get a paycheck, are you just like, oh, well, they really gave, gave me a nice gift today? Probably not. Probably looking at that and you're saying, that's what I earned. And maybe you're checking it to see if there's any discrepancies to see if they might have left something out and they charged too much tax or something like that. You're, you're, you're expecting it when you look at that number because you've worked for it. It's what you have earned. But I ask, do we feel that same way about God's grace? Do we feel like his forgiveness is something that he's given to us or is it something we've earned? Do we think that, like Joey mentioned, through a church attendance, or through good works, or through being a good person, or by, by reading the Bible more, or praying more, that we've so, somehow stored up credit with God, that He owes us something. I don't think most of us would probably say, no, we don't think of it like that. We understand that we can't earn it, but we might say it's a gift, but have, have you ever gotten angry with God? <coughs> I know I haven't. I've gotten angry with Him. When something didn't go the way I thought it should go, or when I'm going through a hardship and I just can't understand what's going on. Or when I have to wait for something that I thought, he really should have been a little quicker about that. You ever gotten impatient with God? I think we all have. Where do those feelings come from? You ever thought, I really deserve better than this when it comes to what God's given me? I think those feelings come from this idea that God somehow owes us. But remember, Abraham got the promise from God and he believed it. Not because he felt like God owed it to him, but because God said it. And the purpose of that, verse 11 of chapter 4, was to make him the father of all who believe. Abraham is the spiritual father of all who believe. It reminds us that it comes by faith. His purpose was to show us that that's how you get into a right relationship with God. But the question is, what exactly did Abraham believe? What made him righteous? Well, Romans chapter 4, we're going to skip down to verse 17 now. Take a look at this. Romans chapter 4, verse 17 says, As it is written, I have made you the father of many nations. In the presence of God, in whom he believed, in whom Abraham believed, he believed that God gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. And in hope, he believed against hope that he should become the father of many nations as he had been told by God, so shall your offspring be. Abraham knew this about God. and This is a powerful truth that I think sometimes we forget. He knew that God gives life to the dead and creates something out of nothing. God gives life to the dead and creates something out of nothing. 
we could just sit and just think about that and praise and worship God for that for the rest of the day. And we still wouldn't quite comprehend it. That God gives life to what is dead. He brings the dead back to life. He speaks into dead situations, to dead hearts, to dead relationships, to dead circumstances. And he brings life and there was no hope for life. He can raise the dead and he can create something out of nothing. God can work with anything. And he can work with nothing and make it something. You ever been told, well, you don't ever amount to anything? Or that's nothing? God can work with that. God can make something beautiful out of that. I love the song by a band called Younger. It's called Beautiful Things. And it says, you, meaning God, makes beautiful things out of dust. You make beautiful things out of us. And it says that Abraham had hope against hope. What does that mean? Abraham, in hope, believed against hope. It means that Abraham had godly hope against worldly hope. Now, what's the difference? Godly hope is based on God and his promises. Worldly hope is based on circumstance, on our ability, on the world around us, on the laws of nature, on the things that we see. Worldly hope is just simply wishful thinking. You might say, well, I hope it doesn't snow tonight so we can have that soup and sandwich meal that we put off last week. I'm really looking forward to it. Or you might say, next week, I really hope that the Patriots don't win the Super Bowl again. I'm tired of them. I don't want to see that. <laughs> but that's just wishful thinking. We don't know that for sure. They might win, and it could snow tonight. I don't, I don't know. I haven't looked at the weather for tonight. but That's just wishful thinking. But godly hope is an assurance that we know it's going to happen. It's based on God and His promises and who He is. It doesn't waver based on our circumstance here in life. And the only difference between fact and hope, godly hope, is that fact is received and godly hope is still in the future. We hope that Jesus will return. That's not saying we wish He will or we think He might. It's saying we know that He will it's just in the future. We know that we have a heavenly home to look forward to. Amen. We don't wish, we don't waver on that. We know it. It's just in the future. We haven't received it yet. Abraham, you might say, okay, well, it's easy for Abraham to believe because God spoke to him. I mean, if the heavens opened up and God spoke to us here, that'd be pretty amazing. And Abraham had that, so of course he believed. Well, you know, Abraham had some circumstances that could have caused him to doubt. When God first made this promise to him, it was 25 years that he had to wait. You ever have to wait for 25 years for something to happen? And the Bible doesn't say that God like had a weekly conversation with him about it. There was probably long gaps of time where Abraham didn't hear from God. But he still believed. Scripture goes on in Romans chapter 4, verse 19, it says, He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was as good as dead since he was about 100 years old, or when he considered the bareness of Sarah's, Sarah's womb. No distrust made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, fully convinced that God was able to do what he promised. That is why his faith is counted to him as righteousness. He didn't waver when he looked at his circumstance. He was 100. He hadn't had any kids. His wife Sarah was 90. She hadn't had any kids. Didn't doubt one bit. Now he did try to take things into his own hands, and that's where we get Ishmael, and you'll read that in there. Maybe because he didn't quite understand what God's promise was. But it didn't cause him to doubt that God could do what he said. And this is going to play an important role next week when we look at when God asked him to sacrifice Isaac. That's why it's coming to him as righteousness. He believed that God is able to do what he promised. Very simple. 
God is able to do what he promised. God is able to do what he promised. It wasn't based on the laws of nature. It wasn't based on his ability. It wasn't based on his circumstance. It was based on God. And so I ask, is our faith based on anything else other than God? When we have a good day, are we strong in our faith? When we leave here feeling great? And when things aren't going so well, do we question and do we doubt? Do you ever think that God might allow some hardship in order for our faith to grow stronger? You say, well, Abraham heard directly from God. You know what we did too? It's called the Word of God. It's called the faithful testimony of those who have gone before us. It's called those throughout the Bible, throughout all of history, for the last 2,000 years, Christians and their faithful witnesses. It's like people in your own life. You have a heritage of faith in your life somewhere. Maybe it's a, a parent or a grandparent. Maybe it's a friend. Maybe it's an aunt or an uncle. Maybe it's someone who helped you in your walk with Jesus. If God can raise the dead and create something out of nothing, is there anything that God can't do? Is there any doubt that He can fulfill the promises that He's given to us? So all of this, this... This example of Abraham is for us to see too. It's not just history that's good to know. It is for our benefit. Go back to verse 22, Romans chapter 4. That is why his faith was counted to him as righteousness. <coughs> but the words that was counted to him were not written for his sake alone, but for ours also. It will be counted to us who believe in him, who raised from the dead, Jesus our Lord. And who delivered, who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. Abraham is the example for us to follow. He said, well, what do we believe? What can we believe here this morning because of Abraham and because of what the Bible tells us? Well, the first thing we can believe is that God's power raised Jesus from the dead. God has the power to bring from death to life and his power raised Jesus from the dead. And if God has the power to do that, He can do anything. God can change your life. Yes. The next thing we can believe is that Jesus' death atoned for our sins. That means that we had a debt that was owed to God because of sin. But Jesus lived that perfect life, and He died on the cross paying that debt for us. Next slide, please. Thank you. Jesus' death atoned for your sins. He was innocent, but he paid for it, past, present, and future. The third thing we can now know is that Jesus' resurrection justified you before God. He died to pay for our sins, and he was raised to make us right with him, to make you in a right standing with God. The word justified is very simple. It's just if I never sinned. God made you justified through Jesus' resurrection. Your sins are no longer counted against you. You have been made clean. You can stand before God. And since God has the power to do all this, He has the power to forgive my sin, your sin, little sins, big sins, as if there's any difference. The only sin that God can't forgive is the refusal to come to Him in faith. If you live your whole life and you refuse to come to Jesus in faith, there is no sacrifice for your sin. You have to believe in Jesus and His power and the power of the resurrection. It's the only way to be forgiven. But for any and all who believe, we have been given that right standing before God and invited into His family. Yeah. Let's finish with one last section here. Chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. Yeah. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through Him we also have obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. 
The fact that we get to stand before God. We stand in grace. And we rejoice in hope. That's what you can believe here today. You stand before God in grace. And you rejoice in hope. Godly hope. The fact that we get to stand before God is an amazing thing. Throughout all the world, whenever someone would come before a king, what would they do? They'd have to bow down. In many places, if you were to look at a king face to face, eye to eye, it's considered very disrespectful. If you were to come into the presence of a king standing, you could be executed for such disrespect. But because of what Jesus Christ has done, our sins have been taken away. We have the ability to stand before God as if we've never sinned. Now, we know we've sinned. But we also know, and this is where we struggle, that if Jesus Christ is our Lord, that He has taken our sin from us. And we can stand in grace. We have a heavenly hope, a guarantee, and a promise. So I ask you here today, where are you? Have you received that grace? Can you stand before God because your sins have been forgiven and you've been made right? Or do you need to come to that place of humbleness? You have to be humble before you can stand. You have to come to Christ, repent of your sins, trust in Him as your Lord and Savior. Be buried with Him in baptism and be raised to a new life. So where are you today? Can you stand or do you need to be humble? Because it is by grace we are saved. And just as Abraham gives us that legacy, that foundation of faith, let us remember that everything we do, not just our Sunday morning selves, but everything we do needs to be rooted and grounded in our faith in Jesus Christ. Lord, we do thank you for being the founder and perfecter of our faith and giving us the example of Abraham. That he believed you, that you had the power to do what you promised, that you were able, that you could make things that were dead come back to life, that you could bring nothing and turn it into something. God, may we have that same faith in you this morning. May you speak into the dead circumstances in our life, into dead hearts this morning, and may you bring life. And may we trust in you, not in ourselves, not in our strength, not in our circumstance, not in our world, not in the laws of nature, not in the things we've been told, not in our own wisdom, but in you and you alone. May we trust and may we hope and may we stand. Help us, Lord, not only to stand, but to walk in the footsteps of Jesus. And if there be anyone here that needs to go through that process of being humble in order to come before you, we pray that you would do that in their hearts today. In Jesus' name.